Let's pray together. God, I pray that your spirit, the spirit that goes before us, the spirit that was in the space this morning before even the first of us walked in, would fill us up. God, would soften our hearts so that we hear what it is that you have for us and then would send us out to serve. Amen. So in the 6th century in Northumbria, this area of like northern England, um, there was a king, a Saxon king, his name was Ethelfirth, and he wanted to invade Wales. He wanted to take over this land in Wales and make it a part of Northumbria. And so he gathers all of his men and um, he prepares for battle and the other side knows this is coming and so the Welsh prepare for battle as well. And on the eve of the attack, when he is going to make his attack the next morning, he is surveying his enemy. And he notices this encampment off to his right that doesn't have any arm, um, weapons. There, there are a number of folks over there, but they are weaponless. There's no cannons in front of them or arrows or whatever. And so he asks one of his folks, he says, who, who are they? What's this deal? And he said, oh, well, you know, the Welsh are a Christian nation. Those are the people that pray. They pray for their army. They pray to defeat the enemy in front of them. Their entire role in battle, their entire role as part of the army is that they pray for their fellow soldiers. And so Ethelfirth, who is this king, he happens to be pagan, doesn't pray, doesn't worship God. He recalculates his whole plan and he says, attack them first. This is a man that doesn't pray himself, but believes so much in the power of prayer that he says, take them out first, because there's something about what they're doing that could lead to their success. Prayer is a powerful thing. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks about how powerful it is. And when we practice daily prayer for ourselves, for our family, for the world, a few weeks ago, we looked at the Lord's Prayer. And Tom talked about how when we pray the Lord's Prayer, that is a signing on for the kingdom of God. That's like saying, I'm in it. I want to be a part of this team and, and do the work of the kingdom and we talked about how we can use that prayer as a shape for our own prayers, right? And so when we pray for daily bread, we pray for the things that we need that are on our hearts, our own supplication. And when we pray for our um, own forgiveness, we think about what it is that we need to be forgiven for. And, and we also name those to whom we need to show grace, to whom we need to offer forgiveness. And this prayer reminds us of that. And then a couple of weeks ago, we looked at John 17 and this prayer for family and for unity. Um, we talked about how Jesus prayed for the disciples the way that we pray for those who have been entrusted to us, the people that we love most in the world and how we pray for their protection, not from bad stuff. Bad stuff happens in the world, but that they would be strengthened in the midst of it, that they would be able to carry forth. And then last week, we talked about how in our prayers with love, we pray for unity to be an example for the world, that the church might be bound together as Christians, we're bound together, and then we can bring that out to the whole world. And today, we are going to talk as Anne Lamott has this book, and it's called Help, Thanks, Wow. And she talks about how these are the only three prayers, help, thanks, and wow. And we're going to talk about the, third, uh, the first one, help, which is, I have to be honest, probably the prayer that I pray the most, right, is, is help. I'm sure a lot of you feel that way as well. That's when we find ourselves in prayer. Let me back up and just say this about prayer, about finding ourselves in that place of help, which is prayer can be the trickiest part, I think, of being a Christian, right? So there are seasons of my life, let me be honest with you, when I feel the Holy Spirit affirming me, I feel the presence of God, I feel like when I am in prayer, I am connected to God, and it is, it is worth my time, and it is wonderful, and I feel I love it. And then there are entire other seasons when I'm just like, is there, how do I know if I'm here? How do I know if God's hearing me? How do I know if this is one-sided? How do I know what God is going to use these prayers to do how do I know if anything is happening on the other side of these prayers? And it can be especially challenging to pray when we find ourselves in seasons of deep pain 
and deep grief and struggle and heartache or facing some type of loss. It can be the hardest time to pray then, especially when we don't feel that connection with God. This is where Jesus found himself. In verse 34, if you look at that, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He found himself in the hardest season and he still goes to God in prayer. And it's symbolic, of course, that he goes to Gethsemane. As many of you know, Gethsemane was the area at the bottom of the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. So across from the city, he goes out essentially into this like miniature wilderness at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. And, and Gethsemane means the press, the oil press. So it's where they would take all the olives from the side of the mountain, all those trees, and they'd bring them down and they'd press them. And in Isaiah, we know it says the Messiah says, uh, the Messiah will be crushed for our iniquities. He will be pressed. This is a place where Jesus is in that pressing, that crushing and he goes to God in prayer. And so I think there are lessons for us in this, that even in the worst period, in the worst time of his life, in that time that he's crying out the help prayer, that he stays in it with God. And so I want to lift up three of these things. And the first one is that you've got to partner up, okay? So Jesus, if, if you look at this in verse 33, it's before our, our reading today, I believe, says, he took Peter, James, and John along with them. He retreated from the world. He retreated from his larger community, but he took his closest companions to be with him when he was praying. He didn't want to go it alone. He knew that he needed people to be with him. He doesn't try to hide from his friends his, his agony. He doesn't sugarcoat it for them. In fact, they are the ones to whom he says that he sorrowed even to the point of death. He admits to them how hard that is. I, I struggle with this a lot, with this idea of transparency and vulnerability. Because I have, I have for a long time not wanted to let people see me in my broken places because it felt like I'd be burdensome to them. I always worry that like it's going to be too overwhelming to someone else if they can see the pain that I'm in. Or that I will be a burden to them that they will have to manage if they are share in whatever I'm going through. This week, one of my dearest friends got COVID. In fact, her husband and her son and she all got it. And I called her and I said, okay, I'm bringing you dinner and I'm gonna bring it at this time and this is what I'm bringing you and there's no arguments. And she was like, no, no, I, you can't do it. I'm fine, we're fine, we have groceries, we don't need it. And um, I said, okay, but you know, I really wanna do this. I know that this is hard, you're sick, you don't feel well. And a few hours later, she texted and she said, white flag, send dinner. And, and the thing about it is, is that she recognized that in this hard week, she needed people to carry her through. And that's just like a little example of what it's like for all of us when we're in hard seasons, which is that we need other people with us to carry us through. We need to reach out to our friends to open ourselves up to other people and to say, partner with me in prayer. Be with me in this hard thing. I am overwhelmed with sorrow and I need you to know about it. And so partner up. The second thing is that we have to stay in it, right? So if someone disappoints you, I don't know if you're like me, but one of my natural responses if someone disappoints me is just to retreat, just to be done with them, just to be like, you know what? I'm not interested in a relationship anymore, or I might just take a season away. It might be permanent, it might just be a season, but my natural thing is just to pull out. In his book on lament in the Psalms, Bernard Anderson writes this. He says, we need to stay in it. We need to be able to let it rip with God and not just leave the relationship. That's because God can handle our complaints. God, God can handle our pain. God can handle the hard things that we are going through, right? If you go back and look at this, Jesus prays three times for the same thing. He says in verse 39, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And then in verse 42, he says again for the second time, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And then in verse 44, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the exact same words. Jesus prays to end the suffering. Of course he does. We see his full humanity on view here. This is what any of us would do. I can imagine that many of us have prayed for a cup to pass us, right? A cup of illness 
or of loss or of grief, whatever that hard thing is that we are facing, we have prayed before for that cup to pass us. What we should do in this is linger with our feelings and express them to God. Because when we are in hard times, the worst thing that we can do is just turn away from God. We should cry out. We should argue. We should, we should be in it with God. David Horton reminded me this week, we were talking about this passage, and he said, you know, remember Israel doesn't mean answers from God. Israel means wrestling with God. Our, we are sustained in our relationship, not when we have the answers, but when we continue to be in that relationship, when we continue to have the conversation that keeps us going. Desmond Tutu tells the story of um, a man that was in a concentration camp with Nazis. And um, he told this in a sermon one time. He was talking about how the Nazis were spitting on this man. He was down in a latrine pit, shoveling human feces, doing the worst job possible. And the Nazis are spitting on him, and they're calling him names. And one of them finally says, well, where is your God now? And he looks up, and he says, my God is down here with me, in it with me. Look, we know God's with us, but sometimes God doesn't answer prayers in the way that we want God to answer prayers. Sometimes the prayers that God doesn't answer are the most painful ones. And so I wonder at that point, how do we get the confidence to continue to pray? How do we get the confidence to move forward in all of this? I want to read to you from the Gospel of Luke what Jesus said in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Look, that verse doesn't promise if we ask for a fish, we get a fish. That verse is not a vending machine. That verse doesn't say we will get exactly what we want. Remember, it says the Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. What we are promised in our hard times and in our prayers when we stick with it is we are promised the presence of God. We are promised that the Holy Spirit, who is our comforter, will be with us. The Holy Spirit, who is our guide, will be with us. The Holy Spirit, who is our advocate, will be with us. There's this funny verse in Psalm 37. It's Psalm 37, 4, and it says, Delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I think that verse, you know, you can read it, and it's like, Delight in the Lord, and he'll give you everything you want in your heart. That's one common misinterpretation of that passage. I think what David was really trying to say in that is, Delight in the Lord... And he will put into your heart the right desires so that your will is aligned with God's will. So that you feel in your prayers that you have the presence of God because you are aligning yourself more closely with God. That what you will desire is God's will. And that's the third thing. The third thing that Jesus teaches us in this prayer in Gethsemane is that we yield to God's will. Look, um, there, a lot of us kind of live by that Frank Sinatra song, you know, and now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case of which I am certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway, but more than that, I've done it my way. Right? So many of us just want to be my way people. We love that bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot, right? Like, and just my co-pilot. God is the rubber stamp that just says okay to the plans I've already made. We sort of treat God like, hey, I'm going to throw up at you what I'm thinking and what I would like. And then I just want you to, to just say, sure, that sounds like a good plan and go with it. I think we too often want to be the captains of our own ship, the master of our destiny. Anne Lamott's book I told you about earlier, Help Thinks Wow, she writes this. She says, I want to tell God what to do. I want to look around and say, look, pal, this is a catastrophe. You have to shape up. But I know it wouldn't work. Because if I were going to begin practicing the presence of God for the first time today, it would help me to begin by admitting the three most terrible truths of existence. We are so utterly ruined 
We are so utterly loved, and we are so utterly in charge of so little. Right? If we were humble in our prayers, what we would be able to say so much more quickly is, we are not in charge. I am not in charge. I cannot fix things on my own. I need God. One of my professors in seminary lost his adult son about 10 years ago. And a few years after he lost him, he was invited to give some lectures in Singapore on, um, on loss and on theodicy and this idea of how we overcome what is evil and hard and terrible in the world. And, and one of the things that he asked, this question that he asked is, why did the Lord not grant our request for healing? And he says, here's the answer. God does indeed know what is best. Our perspective and range of information is limited. Of course, emotionally and psychologically, it makes sense that we get angry with God in these circumstances. However, it makes no coherent or intellectual sense, given what I believe about God, to get angry. What we believe about God is that God is good. What we believe is that There are hard things in the world, and God is good, and God still works good through those things. It just doesn't always look like what we thought the good would look like. For Jesus, too, for his full humanity, it didn't look like what he thought it would look like either. He prayed three times for the cup to pass from him. And so when he finally says in his prayer, your will be done, it's because the will of God is what he truly wanted more than his own will. He confessed that God's will was good and that it was better, but it was still a struggle for him to accept. It was something that he had to pray multiple times in order to accept. And we too, we too need to learn to pray against every fiber of our humanity and be able to do this. And he, he could do this and we could do this too because it started in the context of a relationship. You'll notice he prays, my father, He starts with this closeness to God that isn't just born out of opening himself up to prayer in the midst of the first hard thing, but the consistency of praying to God all of the time through everything in his life and then being able to pray, my father, I trust you, your will be done. In the verses right after our reading for today, the few verses that follow, it says that Jesus returned to his disciples and he said, rise, rise let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just a few verses earlier, Jesus was completely defeated, right? He was saying, take this cup. He was sorrowed to the point of death. And then after his prayer, his prayer that didn't change his circumstances, Judas was still coming. His betrayer was still coming. The prayer hadn't changed his circumstances, but he is able to go to his disciples and say, get up, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. I am ready. Because the prayer didn't change his circumstances. The prayer changed him. The prayer made him more ready to face what it was that was coming. It made him more tied in to what he knew that God had set before him. There is a hymn called, I Am Thine, O Lord, in which one of the lyrics says, Let my will be lost in thine. That's what I think is the summary point. That's what we want when we pray. We want our wills to be tied up so deeply with God's will that our will is lost in God's will, that that all we can see ahead of us is what God wants for us. And to do that, we really have to yield to God. We have to open ourselves up and say, I know that what you have is better than what I have. And as hard as it is, and as much as I'm staying in it and having this conversation with you, I will also humble myself to you. So I want to return one last time to Anne Lamott in this, and it's a trick that she has that has inspired the sermon collateral that y'all got today, which is she has something she calls a God box. And she says it can be anything. She's used pill containers. She's used decorative boxes that friends have given her. The only trick is it has to be a box that exists in space and time, right? It has to be a physical box. And she says, here's what I do. When I have hard prayers, when I have things I'm struggling with, she writes, on a note, I write the prayer with the name of the person about whom I am so distressed or with whom I am angry or describe the situation that is killing me with which I am so toxically, crazily obsessed and I fold the note up and I stick it in the box and I close it 
and then I agree to keep my sticky mitts off of it until I hear back. And so here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like to challenge you to do. You should have gotten one of these when you walked in this morning with your bulletin. If you didn't, you can grab one on the way out from the ushers. This is a piece of flash paper. I want you to go home, and the next time you have a prayer that you're really struggling with, the next time you have something that you really need to stay in conversation with God about, I want you to write it on here. Take a pen, and on this red paper, write your prayer. And then put it on your mirror, or put it in your purse, or in your car, somewhere that you'll see it. And just stay in it. Be in that conversation with God. Remember, wrestle with God over that, and express, lament what is going on and how hard it is. And then When you have gotten to the place where you feel like you can humble yourself to God, when you can say to God, here is the prayer and I've told you all about it and I want your will to lead. There's instructions in this little white piece of paper for how you can make it flash. This is a great old youth group trick. This paper will just burn up and and go away. Um, and, And I want you to do that. And I want you at that moment to say to God, this is yours. Everything, I am not the captain of my own ship. I am not the master of my own destiny. I am actually a humble being who loves you and wants you to lead. And you let that prayer go and let it symbolize the way that you are asking God to let God's will lead you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, um, we, we struggle so much when we have these hard things in our lives to know how to pray or what the prayers are doing or if they matter and and what they're changing, God, you call us to stay in it because we know that you are changing us through these prayers and we know that you hear us when we cry out to you and that your heart softens for us. And so God, whatever that hard thing is that we are dealing with right now and struggling through, I pray God that you would help us to stay in it, to stay open to a conversation with you and that you would humble us, that we might be able to say, Not my will, but yours. It's in your name we pray. Amen.